we find our way to Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to begin in verse number 14. The Bible says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. That's what today is all about. That's what Sunday is about. Let's get light today. We're getting light from the scriptures. We want to know what it is to, to have a family that will honor God. We want to know what it is to have a life that will honor God. And sometimes we simply need to wake up, amen? We need to wake up and see that that's an issue. Uh, yesterday we had the opportunity, some of us, to go to uh, a couple's retreat. And I remember one of, the things, uh, one of the things that came up when we had some Q&A time was just the fact of recognizing there's a problem. So what was he saying is, hey, wake up. Turn the lights on. You've got to recognize there's an issue. Well, as Christians, we need to recognize, hey, we need to wake up. We need to get the lights turned on about our Christian walk, about our family walk, and these type of things. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with, drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Let's pause a moment there, and we're going to go to the introduction. We'll come back to the Scriptures. The introduction says, God's design is that your family will be a strong testimony for righteousness, even as the culture around you collapses into darkness. To survive in this environment, your family must be a spiritual family a family dedicated to following the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. The fullness of the Spirit is essential for having a successful Christian home. In a home where the members are obeying God's command to be filled with the Spirit, there will be certain things that take priority and precedence. Every priority that you have in your heart will eventually show in your life. The seeds that you will sow will eventually produce a harvest. What we focus our time and attention on is what we will end up reaping. You cannot hide your priorities for long. Those that are important to you will eventually show up and it will be evident what really matters to you. So as you attempt to build a spiritual family, here's some things that are priorities in your life and home, which we'll get to those priorities. But just thinking about some of the things I looked over uh, in the uh, introduction, they're thinking about the fact as we... Go into our family, as we look at our family, the essentialness of having of being filled with the Spirit. You know, it takes a Spirit-filled life to be the husband that God's called you to be. It takes a Spirit-filled life to be the wife God's called you to be, to be the Christian that God saved you to be, whether you're married or not. We need the, Spirit of, we need the filling of God's Spirit. We need to be totally yielded to Him. The word priority means regarded or treated as more important regarded or treated as more important. There was some good humor, uh, humor times that we enjoyed yesterday, but it made me, it, it goes along with this, is when we think about priorities, men and women are different, aren't they? There's going to be things that women are, think are priorities, and they are to them, you know, I'm not saying they're not, that men are just like, I don't care, it's not a priority to me. And you know, if I told Faith the other day, and this would be boring, I guess, maybe for some people. But I told her the other day, you know, sometimes I wish I just had the same outfit just to put on every single day. Like the old, you probably don't remember. Anybody in here remember Doug? Daniel, do you remember Doug on Nickelodeon? Did you, you remember, He always wore the same thing. It was a cartoon on Nickelodeon. Some of you never saw that. Some of you are past that age. That's okay, you know. But he always wore the same thing. And, you know, there are some, actually some very successful people in today's world that they just wear the same thing. It's the same colored T-shirt, the same jeans, the same shoes, and they say it's more efficient for focus for their time. What, that's not a priority. Clothes are not a priority to me. But I tell you what, when I got married, I all of a sudden became a life-size Ken doll. And we'd go to the store and face this should look really good on you. And this looks really good together. And no, you're not. When we, when we uh, were dating, she actually went to my closet and she said, when's the last time you wore this? I don't know. Well, you're getting rid of this. When, when did you wear it? You're getting rid of this. I don't like this, this, this. I had, a, I had a really nice Hawaiian shirt, you know. And she said, when have you wore that? I like that Hawaiian shirt. Well, when did you wear it last? I don't know. When are you going to wear it? I don't know. But I like it. No, no, you don't. So she, 
she got rid of what was she saying? She had more of a priority on my wardrobe than I did. And we have some humor about that, but understand each of us has priorities. Each of us has priorities. There's going to be some, and I try to, I try to be closer to caring for the, the look of my vehicles than not, but I'm guilty sometimes of, of not. You, you're going to have some people that have a priority that every single weekend, they're going to be out polishing their car. They're going to be vacuuming the car out. They're, that's a priority. There's nothing wrong with that. We're on the flip side of that. You're going to have some that I saw a funny uh, question from one of the ladies I used to work at work with at Cracker Barrel in Kokomo, and she said, Dear organized parent, what is it like to open your van doors and not have French fries and trash fall out of your doors? And so she was saying that's not a real high priority in my life. You know? But you recognize priorities. Priorities in our life are those things that are regarded or treated as more important. We want to have the priorities of a spiritual family. If we want to survive our world, we want to survive the attack of what's around us, which we'll look at, we need to have spiritual priorities. There's things we can look at having a spiritual family, priorities there, having a spiritual priority in our single life and uh, as grandparents as parents you get the idea but we understand if in Ephesians chapter 5 we see some of the things that tell us exactly what the will of God is a lot of times we say man I I just want really knew what would like to know what the will of God is I, I just really want to know because we act sometimes like the will of God is some great big mystery don't we it's some we're, we're gonna the clouds are just gonna part and we're gonna see it spelled out in in letters in the sky no, it doesn't happen that way. We get in God's word, and where he definitely gives us the clear direction of what his will is, do it, and then there's going to be times where maybe you're, you're trying to figure things out, but if you're doing the things that you know to be right, then he gives you some more light. And that's what to do. We're, we're waking up. Awake thou that sleepest. We want to be woke up. Let's wake up and let's get the light. One thing that we see is the will of God. We talked about redeeming the time, understanding what the will of the Lord is, being filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves, this is Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I've been enjoying Pastor's series on Wednesdays about the majesty of music and, and getting to, to learn some of those things and be reminded of some of those things. We are... We are uh, beings, human beings, that music is a part of our life. And I understand that some people don't like it as much as some others, but the Word of God tells me that the will of God is that I speak to myself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Verse 20, giving thanks always, always for all things unto God. So understanding that part of God's will is to give thanks. Verse number 21, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, which we'll see <coughs> some more of that. It's not even though verse twenty-two says wives submit yourselves. It's not just about wives submitting. It said submitting yourselves one to another. For the um, verse number twenty-five, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. We see some of the priorities, some of the will of God. And every priority in our life, every priority that we have, eventually will come out. You know, there are things that we enjoy that are going to come out in our communication, the things that we talk about. You know, there might be some people here in March. We're going to have March Madness, some of us over at Bayview, and we're going to play basketball. And I happen to know Brother Daniel and I, we like basketball. I talked to Brother Mike Mimmel, and he doesn't care about basketball. He's, that's not his sport. You know, he's a better so soccer, if I remember right. He enjoys soccer. I'm terrible at soccer. They actually asked me, I remember at Crown going to play with some of the guys just for fun, and I didn't know any better about cleats. I didn't really know there was a difference and I had football cleats, and football cleats, like American football cleats, you know. They have a, they have metal, and they have a toe cleat. 
So that toe cleat helps get you that extra grip and everything. Well, if you're playing soccer and you have that toe cleat on and you're kicking at the ball and kicking somebody in the legs and the shins, they ask you not to come back. And so that, that's about my experience with soccer. So, and I understand why now because I know there's a difference. You know, it's just kind of those poor guys. I just mauled them up with my toe cleats, I guess. But understand the priorities. You know, people have different priorities. It comes out with what they communicate. But you cannot hide your priorities for long. People can say one thing and say, oh, yeah, this is important. But eventually their life tells on them, tells on them as to what is really important. And so that's why it's important for us to have the right priorities so that when our life tells on us, it's telling on us in a positive way. The first point that we see today is the priority of a godly testimony. The priority of a godly testimony. Why is it important? Why is it important that I have a godly testimony? Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Familiar verse to many, but this is why it's important. Because in 1 Peter chapter 5, you're finding your way there. We're talking about the priority of a godly testimony. The Bible says, be what? Somebody say it out loud. Be what? Be Sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The word there, be sober. A lot of times we think of sober as somebody who's not drunk. That's not what the word there is implying. It's talking about being serious. Being serious about being vigilant, being on guard. We have a, we have a, a culture that is... Uh, going to attack and going to try and influence them the wrong way. We need to return to seriousness in our Christian testimony. I thought back to, as I, as I thought about this, I enjoy watching medieval documentaries and shows and things like that where they got the swords and the bows and the crossbows and all that stuff. And I enjoy watching you know, historical things like that. And when the king goes and he gets his generals together, and he pulls them, pulls them together and says, okay, we're going to have to attack here or here or here. You know, I never see a certain individual at the battlefield when it comes down to plans for the battle. I never see the jester. You know, the court jester, he was the fool that would do the somersaults and make jokes and act like a goofball. He was a fool. He's never there when it comes time to make the battle plans. Why? Because when it comes time to make the battle plans... There's no place for fools. There's no place for silliness. Hey, Christian, we're talking about battle plans today. There's no place for us to be silly about it. You know, I enjoy being silly sometimes. I enjoy having fun. We had some good times with some of the cut-up things that we did yesterday. I'm going to enjoy uh, in a couple of days when I get to see my kids, and we're going to goof off and laugh, and we'll have fun. But this isn't the time for that. We need to determine that we're going to get serious about our Christian lives, about our families. We're going to consciously make the choice of, hey, I'm going to watch out for my family. I'm going to watch out for me. Get serious about it. Why? Because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You know, we need, we need to understand this, too, that on our own, you, you think about um, think about it kind of like this. The United States of America, if for whatever reason, Vatican City, you know, that's a, it's its own nation. That's where the Pope is in charge. You know. If Vatican City all of a sudden said, we're going to raise an army and we're going to attack the United States, not a one of us would lose any sleep whatsoever. Why? They can't get to us. We're bigger than they are. We're stronger than they are. They can't touch us. But, if it was the opposite way around, and all of a sudden we're Vatican City, and the U.S. says, you know what, we're going to declare war on Vatican City. We'd be like, oh, what are we going to do? We'd need somebody to back us up. You know, if we tried to do that on our own, we'd be destroyed. Well, why is it so many of us as Christians are deciding, you know what, I got this, God. I, got the, I can handle this. I got this. And the devil comes along and mops us up and destroys us. Why? When all of a sudden, actually, here, here's a great true illustration. Think about Israel. 
Israel. Now, I know God is on Israel's side. I get that. But a lot of, they would probably face a lot more wars if the U.S. wasn't their ally. If they said, take their hands off. And I'm not saying that God wouldn't deliver them, so don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying that as a deterrent to other nations. Well, when we get, when we recognize that we're, we're God's children, you know, he, he's with us, then, and we take our part of being sober and being vigilant, then we have a chance to win. Then we have a chance to keep the devil out. We need to be serious about this. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because of those who are watching. This is a little audience participation. Okay, I'm asking for real audience participation. Somewhere between children's classes where they all want to raise their hands to adults where everybody's like, ooh. Okay, we're going to find somewhere in the middle. Who do you think is watching you? This is a real question. Raise your hand. Who is watching you in your life? Your children, that's right. Joe? Co-workers, that's right. I have a list over here. Those are two of them. Who else? Neighbors, who else? Relatives, that's right. I'd written those things down. Children, spouse, friends, family. Spouse, by the way. Nobody knows you like your spouse does. Nobody knows me like Faith does. Nobody knows Faith like I do. You know? They're watching. They're watching. Our children are watching. I can remember as a, uh, when Bella was first getting to where she could say things. And one of, the, one of the first things she said, I'm not saying like the very first word, but one of the first phrases that she started saying was, confounded potatoes, because mommy would be in the kitchen and working on potatoes, peeling them or whatever she was doing. She got mad at potato, the potatoes and, confounded potatoes. And so the baby, baby Bella is saying, you know, Confound it, ta- confound, how does she say it, dear? Found it, Tato's, confound it, Tato's, you know, just, she learning things. It makes us watch our mouths, makes us want to guard our testimony. Our neighbors are watching. You know, we get up and <clears throat> we're headed to church on Sundays. They see that. We need to have opportunity. we need to take opportunities, and this is something uh, Faith and I recently talked about, we, we're trying to work on, is being more neighborly, so that, a, if I give them an invite to church, you know, they're not surprised by it. What? Huh? I've never talked to you before in my life and you're coming over. You know, we need to be neighborly. But then secondly, they shouldn't be surprised by it either. You know, so, so our neighbors are watching. Our coworkers are watching. There ought to be a difference in the way you work at work than the person who says they're not saved. There ought to be a difference in your attitude. There ought to be a difference in your testimony there. When the guys are off telling dirty jokes, you ought not be a part of that. When the ladies are off gossiping about who did what with who and when, you ought not be a part of that. Our testimony should be guarded. That way when somebody, that was one of those things when uh, I used to work outside of the ministry, there would be some people who didn't really like you a whole lot, and maybe they didn't want to spend a lot of time with you. But you know what I found out is when they had trouble in their life and they wanted to look for somebody to pray for them, they weren't going to the people they normally went to. That's when they'd show up and say, hey, this is going on in my life, and I'm facing it. Can you pray for me? What happened is you gained some value there because you kept your testimony. Keep your testimony, folks. Keep that testimony. That's what people see about you. So those are watching. The world is watching. Our family, our friends, our spouse, our children, coworkers. Uh, Understand that as we think about this, we need to be on guard. These are watching... But when we think about 1 Peter 5, 8, about being sober, be vigilant, we are on guard. What are we to be on guard against? What do you think are some things that try to attack us? And this, is, again, is an audience participation question. What are some things that you can think of that are an attack to you, that you have to be on guard? Help me out. What do you think? Temptations. Anything specific? Could be anything? Okay. He sure will. I'll give you a, t- here's a, here's a uh, modern day temptation. I told, uh, told this with faith. Actually, I was sharing this with Pastor the other day. I, Pastor, I was uh, saying uh, about, uh, my wife has my back. She's my accountability partner. And there are times where she'll ask me, have you had any victories lately? What she's saying is, has there been a temptation that came across that you overcame? We used to, we, she used to ask, has there been, have you fallen recently? 
And there was shame in that. And I like how we, cha- we changed it up where now we can rejoice in victories. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying I was, you know, was looking at all kinds of pornography or something. But as men, what I'm saying is we know that our eye gates, we've got to guard it, right? And so a modern technology temptation, there's a video on Facebook. It's about heavy-duty machinery that moves dirt. That's pretty cool stuff. I click on that. Watching the big machines move dirt. This is a true story. Watching the big machines move dirt. The next video, watching some more big machines move dirt. Then the next video is scantily clad women. I'm thinking, where did this come from? These are machines moving dirt and this, what? We've got to be on guard against that. You know, we have to be prepared for that. And maybe that means removing Facebook. Maybe that means don't click on the videos now that I know that. But we've got to be on guard. You know, we've got to be on guard about, uh, uh, about uh, those that would influence us in the wrong way, those that would uh, uh, talk against us, to maybe talk against your spouse or talk against your pastor, talk against your family. We've got to be on guard. So temptations, they think about the world, the flesh, and the devil, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. What else might there be something we need to be on guard against? We think about temptations. Thought life, perfect, exactly. Our thought life. You know, there's hundreds and thousands of thoughts that go on in our heads. Even the ladies, you think and talk about a lot more than us men do. We talked about the nothing box that us men like to go to sometimes and just think about nothing. Even though we like to go there, there's still plenty of time where we think about stuff. You know, and there's thoughts that go on in our heads, and ladies, you're there too. Just having a thought... It's not wrong. It happens. But there are going to be some thoughts that come into the mind that we entertain, and that's when it becomes sin. We entertain that thought, and we have a second thought, and a third thought, and we build on that. And I'm not talking, it doesn't have to be a lustful temptation. It might be, you know, I get to think of this is one thing we've, I've uh, thought about, is how uh, the the um, dangers of comparison, that's a good way to put it. A lot of times we are guilty of pointing out in our minds, well, she or he doesn't do this, rather than focusing on the fact that, well, he or she does do this, 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 It's but she doesn't do this. You know, we get Adam and Eve syndrome, don't we? Instead of thinking, man, God has given us this great garden, Everything in here is mine. Everything in here is accessible to me. Instead, it's this one thing over here. God is not a good God. He said, I couldn't have this tree. I couldn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, uh, I couldn't. He is such a bad God. I can't eat of this. What happened? They took their focus off of everything we have. Well, we've got to be on guard. We've got to guard against those uh, temptations, those Thoughts, we've got to guard the gates, the eye gate, the ear gate. We have to guard those things. You think about uh, uh, the story of the Trojan horse and the great war that went on. I enjoyed Greek mythology growing up. Uh, and I don't know that all this ever happened, but I do know that the principle is there. The Trojan horse, the Greeks left, but they left behind a prize for their enemies, the Trojans. And it was a great big horse, and inside were Greek soldiers, and they brought the Trojan horse inside the walls of Troy, and they had a great big party, and they all passed out. And then the Greek soldiers got out of the Trojan horse, and they went to the gate, opened up the gate. Greek army floods in, sacks the city, wins the day. But what all happened was something snuck in. They, not only, not really, I mean, they snuck in by a trick, but the Trojans allowed it in. They brought it in, and then it opened up the gates. Hey, Christian, what are you allowing in? You know, they should have burned that, burned that horse on the beach, shouldn't they? Had some cooked Greeks that way, you know? But guess what? There's things that we're guilty of. Oh, well, this isn't such a big deal. Let's let it in. I'll just, it'll, it'll be my pet sin for a little while. Just, it'll, it's okay. You know, don't, be on guard. Be on guard. We think about the testimony. The testimony of a surrendered will. The testimony of a surrendered will. Will back to Ephesians chapter five. 
as we think about a surrendered will, we're submitting ourselves one to another. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 21, it says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. There was a, a preacher who, who shared this truth about kindness between a man and his wife, a spouses. Or this is really good in just any relationship. But this phrase has stuck with me is, Outdo one another in kindness. Outdo one another in kindness. Well, what do you mean by that? That's part of submitting our will. Uh, this was a real practical one. Came up recently. Face downstairs. She's settled in on the couch. I'm walking down. Halfway down the stairs. I shared this with Brother Joe and Miss Sarah yesterday. Walking down the stairs. And she says, hey, can you go get me some water? One of these is the right reaction. Really? I'm halfway down the stairs. Why couldn't you have called me when I was up the stairs? The other reaction is, sure, honey, I'll do that for you. Now, I won't tell you which way I reacted, but it might not have been the best way. But what, what was the problem? As I shared this with our, you know, a little bit of testimony yesterday, yesterday is when we have the idea, and this is all about having a priority of a godly testimony, because if we are who we need to be with our spouse, that's going to show to others. But instead of, instead of being selfish and thinking, this is an inconvenience to me, let's take that as an opportunity to serve the one we love. You know, it was a pretty big inconvenience for Jesus to leave heaven to come down here and sweat and be tired and be hungry and, yeah, eventually die on a cross for you and I. Hey, gentlemen, the Bible told us that I'm supposed to love my wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So if that means turning your butt around and walking the ten steps up to the kitchen and pouring a glass of water, do it. It's not that big a deal. You know, look at that as an opportunity to serve and to say, hey, honey, I love you. You know, and as a, as a, as a lady, look for opportunities to serve your husband. You say, I don't want to serve that guy. Well, if that's your attitude, that's the wrong attitude. Because we're supposed to submit ourselves one to another. You know, uh, there's, things, there's things in the home. I rarely ever do laundry. That's not to say that I'm a bad guy who... I'm not going to do laundry. That's not the thing, no. But you know what? Miss Faith ne rarely ever mows the lawn. It's my job. I'm not saying if you're a lady who likes to mow the lawn, if that's your arrangement, hey, good for you. But at our house, I mow the lawn. She does most of the laundry. It's, you know, we're, but that's our way of serving one another. I want to, ha I want, you know, you get the idea. We're trying to, we're trying to work together. Understanding the principle that your will is to be in submission first to God and then to your spouse. There's going to be times as that preacher talked about your wife might want to watch a chick flick. And you might have to sit down and, and watch a chick flick. You might not, and I'm not saying you have to, but it might be in your best interest to watch a chick flick and submit your will, therefore, to her. And you get the idea. It's, hey, it's it's about working together here. The Bible says in Proverbs 15:1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Any of you ever learned that the hard way? You said something you wish you hadn't said? Okay, nobody else in here is going to admit that. Okay, I'll raise my hand big in the air, and you can't take it back, and I, I get that. But you know what I've also found in relationships as far as a spouse as well as in relationships, period? If you start something in an argument, that's what you're going to get back. You know, if you attack somebody, expect an attack back. You know, it's, but that's where the Bible says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. You know, it's kind of like this. Uh, as a basketball referee, if I get attitude from a coach or a player in the wrong way, there's a big difference this way. If I make a call and a coach says, that's the worst call I've ever seen in my life, if he shouts that and you don't even know the rule book. You know what? It's really easy to go, Doot! technical foul on the coach. But you know what? If I make a call, and by the way, I'm not perfect. I do JV basketball. I'm not a varsity official yet, and varsity officials aren't perfect either. I'll go ahead and tell you that means that I'm on the lower rung. 
but I'm pretty good at what I do. And, but if I kick a call is what we call it, is maybe not get it right. If a coach uh, pulls you, if, if there's time and the coach says, what did, what did you see over there? You know, I, I had a, there was a, a, a lady coach, and I saw something, and it looked different. I thought I saw it one way. They had a different angle, and she said, I think she actually just had it slapped out of her hands. Or basically what she was saying was, I think that we might have had a better view, and that's not really what happened. I can say, hey, coach, maybe you're right. But what happened there? It was a soft answer, wasn't it? And say, I said, okay, I'll, I'll look for that. You know, but if they'd have come out and said, I can't believe you called that. I can, what are you doing out here? You don't belong, you know. Oh, dude. You know? Well, sometimes in our, in, our, in our families, now neither one of us gets to wear a referee suit and blow the whistle and call the technical in there, even though that would make for a pretty good YouTube video, I think. But, you know, you just think about it as, you know, a soft answer turned his way wrath. You want to have peace in your home? Don't be so quick to argue. Think before you speak. It's a really good idea. It's a really good idea, period. Think before you speak. Don't, you don't have to say what's on your mind. I'm just saying what's on my mind. Yeah, how's that going for you? Just something to think about. When we act that way, when we're, when we're arguing, when we're nagging about things, I, it was funny yesterday as, Ladies, you don't have to, if you told your husband, if you asked him to do something, you don't have to remind him every six months. He knows. It'll get done, okay? No. But it was just kind of, it was humorous. But understand that we can, in our lives, we can, we can uh, build love and honor and respect, or we're going to build resentment by the way we talk to one another. The testimony of a godly lifestyle. The testimony of a godly lifestyle. Let it be. I have to speed up here. Uh, we need to understand the testimony of a godly lifestyle. People are watching. We just talked about that. You know how, you know how to have the godly lifestyle is don't focus on living the godly lifestyle. Focus on being who God wants you to be. Don't focus on doing. Focus on being. If I am who I'm supposed to be, then I will do what I'm supposed to do. When I was in high school, I was an Oak Level Baptist Academy conqueror. I'd put the uniform on, and I'd go play basketball. I scored all of about two to four points a game. Nothing really to brag about. But one thing that I never did, because I knew what team I was on, I personally never took the basketball and put it in the wrong basket. I didn't decide, oh, well, I wear this uniform but all of a sudden, even though the Fellowship Eagles are beating us every time we play against them, I'm going to join their team and score against ourselves. I never did that. Why? Because I knew whose team I was on. Okay? The testimony of a godly lifestyle, don't focus on doing everything, filling in your blanks, check mark, check mark. No, focus on being. If we focus on being the Christian that Christ has saved us to be, then the other things take care of themselves. Hey, it was, it was uh, my opportunity and, and uh, privilege to preach today. Well, part of that, it's not a, in, in, w with that opportunity comes some responsibility. Being the assistant pastor comes with some responsibilities. If I show up here in my pajamas and I'm all dirty and I haven't shaved and I haven't showered and I come up here, oh, hey, let's open the Bible, you know, it's not going to come across the right way, is it? I haven't prepared. You know, but because that's something I get to do, I'm going to clean up. I'm going to try and have the right appearance. I'm going to try and bring something of value to you. For your, your, you're exchanging your time and attention. I want to give you value. You know, part of that comes from the lesson. Part of that comes from the Bible message that we're going to hear later. I want to give that value back. We want to, have, we want to focus on being who we ought to be. Focus on being who you ought to be instead of doing, instead of just, instead of focusing on the doing part. If we focus on the being part, the doing will come naturally. Do you follow that? And maybe you say, well, it's just too late for me. I've ruined all this. And no, you got to start somewhere. I think I like to listen to uh, Dave Ramsey. You don't have to like him, but I like him. He, he talks all about getting out of debt and all these things. 
A person who's in debt, let's say they're $80,000 in debt, and he hears their, he'll hear out their income, and he'll kind of put them on a plan. You know, that person has to start somewhere. They could say, well, I'm $80,000 in debt. I might as well just keep going. Or they can get started and go after it. Or a year later, they might call Dave and say, hey, Dave, I called last year. I was $80,000 in debt. Right, where are you at now? I'm $100,000 in debt. Oh, you get that? Hey, Christian, you've got to start somewhere. Start today. Number two, the priority of a spiritual heart. Our spiritual heart, we think about we need to be yielded. A, outward beauty is temporary. Probably don't have to say a whole lot with that. We all understand that our outward uh, appearance changes. Um, you know, we're going to, I was 104, now I probably needed to gain some weight when I was in high school. I was 145 pounds at 5'10". I probably should have found a happy medium at 175, but I went ahead and gained some more. So I'm about 210, and I can probably, no, two, anyway, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not the perfect specimen that you would imagine. Neither are any of you, okay? Our outward appearance fades. Our outward beauty is temporary. Inward beauty, inward, inward beauty, letter B, is eternal. Inward beauty is eternal. Be cautious with what you allow to influence your thinking so that your spirit will not be drawn away from God. We need to focus on our inward beauty. Again, on being the Christian that Christ has saved us to be. Our inward beauty. Number three, the priority of a respectful manner. The priority of a respectful manner. So we had, uh, we had number one was the priority of a godly testimony. Number two was the priority of a spiritual heart. Focus on the inward. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Number three, the priority of a respectful manner. Be respectful to others. Be respectful to your spouse. Be respectful to your children. You say, I have to do that to my kids? Well, if you answer them in the right way, you teach them that way, it's going to be responded back, the, that, uh, responded back the same way. You think about the Bible, it says, uh, provoke not thy children to wrath. You know, don't wrath them to wrath. If you speak anger into their life, that's probably what's going to come out later on. So be respectful. The priority of a respectful manner, that's family. That's our friend relationships. Jesus doesn't just tell us what to do, but he tells us how to do it in the Word of God. Letter A, compassion. Compassion, Bible compassion is more than just a feeling. It's a feeling that is so strong, it produces a response and an action. Do you have compassion in your life? Do you have such love for others that you're willing to act on it? Letter B, love. Letter B is love. We need to love one another. We need to demonstrate that love to one another. Under, learn, I will suggest this, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but I would suggest a handy tool is finding out uh, by Gary Chapman, the book, The Five Love Languages. The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. If you don't know anything about it, look it up. There are ways that you can say I love you to a person, and if they don't speak that language, they aren't hearing you. This has changed my life in relationships when I learned how to say I love you in their language. My grandmother, she's an active service person. So that's the way she says I love you, is serving one another. So if I want her to know I love her, I serve. She likes gifts. So if I give her a good gift, she hears I love you. There are other people, they're not gift givers. You know, that's not the way they hear love. So understand, there's different ways of giving and receiving love. I suggest learn that. Letter C, pity. Pity is demonstrating a tender heart. Let's be tender to one another. Let go of your right to be angry. Replace those feelings with the same understanding spirit that you want extended to you when you fail. Letter D, courtesy. Courtesy means to be lowly-minded, kind, or friendly. Let's be courteous and friendly to one another. And then blessing. Blessing means to bless, uh, means to honor, speak well of, or to celebrate with praises. Our words have tremendous power. If we want to have a godly testimony as a family, part of that's going to be our words. I know we all grew up with the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a nice little saying, but it's not true. Words do hurt. You, you, you know, words do hurt. Especially what, what parents say to kids, it can hurt. What you say to your spouse, it can hurt. So instead of, instead of speaking 
hard words to one another, let's bless one another. Make that choice. You see, all these things that we talked about today, nobody's going to make you do them. You know, nobody's going to, I'm not going to hold a gun to your head and say, okay, love your spouse, love your friends, be a godly testimony. It wouldn't be a very godly testimony on my part to be holding guns to people's heads, but you understand, the, you understand what I'm saying. It's not something that anybody can make you do. You have to choose to do it. You have to make the choice. These are not, a, these are not issues of can or can't. These are issues of will or won't. So make the decision today that you're going to wake up, turn the lights on, and determine that you're going to have a godly testimony. Make that a priority in your life. For a family, for an individual, make it a priority. Father in heaven, I pray that you would guide our thoughts, guide our lives, help us to apply these things uh, that we've learned today, help us to determine to make it a priority to have godly testimony in our families. For your glory, in Jesus' name.